Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us today for the FAA's General Aviation Safety Town Hall, where we're going to discuss the impacts from COVID-19 on this safety of, the vital, of this vital industry. We're coming to you today on Zoom, as well as on the FAA's Facebook and YouTube and Twitter live streams. Before we start, I would like to provide just a few housekeeping rules. First off, I wanna emphasize that we are not here to solicit consensus advice or recommendations from anyone, but we do wanna take your questions. In order to do that, we will be posting the Google Form link on the chat feature of this Zoom meeting, as well as on the live stream. Feel free to submit a question at any time. After each panel, we will select some of the questions that you have submitted via the Google Form and the moderate, ask the moderator to discuss them with this panel. Our FAA team is, moder is monitoring the live stream, so if you have any issues at all, please feel free to let us know. With that, let's get started. FAA Administrator Steve Dixon is with us to set the stage for today's discussions. Administrator Dixon, Dixon has been leading the FAA in our efforts to ensure the safety of the nation's aerospace system, as well as the safety as our, of our own employees during the COVID-19 public health emergency. We will now initiate a live feed from Administrator Dixon, and he will provide some opening remarks to get our discussion started. Well, thank you, Brianna, and thanks everyone for joining us today. You know, from the largest business jet to the sleekest turbine helicopter to the smallest single engine piston airplane, GA is the lifeblood of our incredibly flexible and responsive air transportation system. It has unique challenges punctuated by the shifting demand and extreme variety in operations, and we at the FAA are committed to working with the industry to ensure its health and viability in this time of fast change and new threats. So again, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see uh, you all with us. Thank you for attending our virtual General Aviation Safety Town Hall. And after I say a few uh, words here, we'll convene two panels to discuss a wide range of timely topics for GA, including the impact, of course, of the COVID-19 pandemic, operational experiences that you're seeing in the field as a result of the crisis, best practices that you've come up, up with to mitigate safety issues and considerations for how best to move forward. We'll also take some questions from the attendees after each of the panels. Now this meeting con uh, complements a similar online gathering we held last month with the airline industry where we looked at unique challenges to that sector following a precipitous drop in traffic. Before COVID-19, U.S. airlines were moving about a billion passengers a year, and we as an industry had achieved a safety record that was and remains the envy of the world. But between March and early June, operations at our top 30 airports have plunged as much as 92% compared to seasonal norms. The Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, who I'm happy could join us today, published a story about how at certain times of day in the U.S. right now, the number of Cessna Skyhawks in the air is greater than the number of Boeing 737s, which as we all know is the most prolific airliner type in the world. But as you can imagine, the drop in traffic is not good for the bottom line. The International Civil Aviation Organization is estimating that the industry will be facing a potential loss of revenue of as much as $314 billion for airlines and $100 billion for airports uh, this year. Now here at the FAA, our bottom line is safety. And early on, we became concerned about how such a massive slowdown, coupled with a global health emergency, could impact the safety of all aviation. That's one of the reasons that I asked our safety team to pull together these virtual safety town halls. Now, at the airline town hall, we discovered how risk management tools, including mandatory safety management systems, which we all know as SMS, are providing their worth right now proving their worth right now, and just as importantly, how they will be invaluable as airline travel begins to recover. A key element of an SMS is safety risk management, or SRM, which is designed to support risk-based decision-making by identifying, evaluating, and controlling safety risk. Now, SRM is a five-step process that first requires an understanding of how a process or system works, and then enables a means to identify, analyze, assess, and control safety risk on the aviation system. SRM is a continuous loop, meaning that we repeat the process until the safety risk associated with each hazard is acceptable. Now, during the airline town hall, we recognized 
that SMS has been a key factor in helping the FAA and carriers identify and mitigate potential threats, such as knowing in advance where and when aircraft servicing might no longer be available, or learning that the risk of a surface event remained relatively high despite lower traffic levels, or figuring out how to safely park thousands of airliners on airport surfaces without impacting ground safety. Now, of course, I recognize that a full SMS may not be practical for smaller GAA operations, but the concepts of identifying the threats, mitigating risks, continuously evaluating how you're doing and sharing your experiences with the broader community still hold. T today's event is a perfect event a venue for you, the experts, to share other ways you may have discovered or invented uh, to gather and share risks and mitigations. Another point that came through loud and clear in the airline safety town hall, which I think directly applies to GA, is that collaboration and communication make all the difference. That means sharing best practices throughout the industry and forging a closer relationship with the regulator. Of course, that's us. That's crucial to powering through this crisis and getting back to a new, a new normal, whatever that looks like. Today's meeting is all about the impacts to general aviation and what we can do together to help each other ensure safety. For our first panel, FAA Deputy Administrator Dan Elwell and industry experts will discuss impacts facing the GA sector now and into the future and best practices and solutions that you can share with your fellow pilots and operators. Our second panel will be moderated by FAA Office of Safety Standards Director Bruce DeClean. Now, Bruce and his experts will highlight airworthiness considerations and operational support impacts related to COVID-19. I want to thank all the participants on the panels for taking the time and effort to join us today. I think uh, we all really appreciate this. Your presence here shows your commitment to safety, your leadership, uh, and your commitment to the health of this industry. Please know that we at the FA really are here to help and to support the aviation community as a whole as we get back to a new normal. I also want to welcome all of our participants on Zoom, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, and I look forward to gaining insight into your unique challenges and your innovative solutions through your questions to the panelists. So that's it. I'll be back uh, with you uh, again at the end of the at the end of the session. Uh, but for now, back to you, Brianna. Thanks, Steve. We will now enable the live feed for each of our panel one participants. I'd like to introduce FAA Deputy Administrator Dan Elwell, who will moderate the first session. Thanks, Brianna. And uh, thanks, Steve, for teeing up my session, Pandemic Impacts, Today and Into the Future. You know, it's sort of ironic that today, Thursday, June 18th, is International Picnic Day. I'm sure we can all agree that the past few months have been everything but a picnic for the aviation family as our livelihoods and our personal lives have been transformed by this health crisis, perhaps forever. And we're here to talk about how we can make safety our primary objective despite everything else going on. And Steve mentioned the massive drop in traffic for passenger airlines and the resulting new stressors on the system the GA traffic trends are much less homogeneous and the emerging trends therefore could be harder to detect. It's an issue that has our full attention at the FAA. Unlike for airlines, which are all suffering, with perhaps the exception of a few cargo carriers, how you're doing in the GA world probably depends on what type of aircraft you're flying, supporting or manufacturing. And according to the flight tracking company FlightAware, the average daily operations for the business jet sector in the US was down more than 70% in mid-March to mid-April compared to what we might call the good old days, early March. However, as of early June, business jet operations had recovered to nearly 75% of March operational levels. Likewise, turboprop operations were down about 60% in the same time period, but by early June, we're down just over 10%. Piston-powered aircraft similarly saw a low in operations of as much as 50%, but already have recovered to pre-COVID-19 levels by the end of May. The rotorcraft sector fared best, 
with operations dropping only about 30% at its lowest point before also recovering to normal levels by mid-May. And regardless of whether your operations are up or down, you are likely experiencing many of the same new stresses and threats that the airlines and your neighboring GA sectors are experiencing, plus other unique obstacles that we hope to uncover by collaborating in part through events like this. As Steve said, airlines are using their SMS processes to flush out, mitigate, and monitor their newly emerging threats. This also includes concerns about contracting and spreading the virus, as well as psychological impacts related to job security. As one of our airline pan panelists said at the previous town hall, having those concerns in the back of your mind can be not only disruptive to how you operate, but it can become potentially debilitating. Another key tenet of SMS is that the sharing of de-identified data outside of an organization will make us all safer. The FAA has been working with the GA community, particularly flight schools and universities for the past seven years to collect and analyze flight data to look for emerging safety issues as part of the Aviation Safety Information Analysis and Sharing System, or ASIAS. In fact, in 2019, we reached an important milestone. More than 1 million hours of GA flight data had been brought into ASIAS by recreational pilots, universities, flight schools, and business aviation. Along with participation in ASIAS, which we hope everyone will consider, a very effective way to share your experiences with peers is to use your internal safety reporting systems or NASA's Aviation Safety Reporting System or ASRS. Right now, we need your help in identifying safety challenges related to COVID-19 and encourage you to submit your concerns using your internal safety reporting programs or ASRS. This information could literally save someone's life. And with that background, I'd like to introduce our panel, and then we'll get to some questions here and then from our attendees. So with us today, we have Mark Baker, President and CEO of the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association. Mark brings more than 40 years of involvement in the GA community as a pilot, along with decades of experience in the leadership positions, in leadership positions in the home improvement industry. Jack Pelton, CEO and Chairman of the Board, Experimental Aircraft Association. Jack's a lifelong aviation enthusiast, and leads EAA's board and staff in its mission to grow participation in aviation and inspire people to fly, build, and further engage in flight. And David Dalpiez, VP Flight Services, Jet Aviation, the Americas. David holds an FAA airframe and power plant inspector authorization and a private pilot license. And he also served in the U.S. Army with the 5th Battalion, 101st Special Forces Aviation Regiment. Thanks for your service, David. And Jalen Williams, CEO of Air Methods, an air medical service company. Jalen is responsible for overall management and growth of the company. Having come to Air, Method, air Methods from GE Healthcare Digital. Jalen is also the recipient of Health Data Management Magazine's Most Powerful Women in Healthcare IT Award. And now I'll start with some questions for the panelists. What I'd like to do folks is uh, we'll start with some light aviation questions and these will be uh, for primarily for Mark and Jack. And uh, let's just dive into it. What are some of the unique challenges facing your respective organizations and your members? And you're muted, Mark. Unmute, how about now? Good, you thanks, Dan. Uh, sorry about that. Um, you know, one of the things that we've seen and we've appreciated the support that the FA did for the SFAR and doing the extensions for medicals and, and CFI and all the other things that have time limited kinds of issues and we're still going to say we're probably going to need to continue to look at that, uh, with whether it's a medical or for asking for you know another ninety days to take a look at that because I know people. I talked to a member this morning that was trying to get to Arizona to do his, his medical from Montana, and doesn't really want to travel to Arizona for his doctor right now. Mm -hmm. So we've got some of those kinds of issues that we 
appreciated the support from the FAA and understanding and trying to do the right thing. But I think we're going to probably need to take a look at that some more on some of those extensions. So that's, that'd be my number one issue right now. Yeah. Okay. I would say we are exactly the same lined up with Mark as far as that's our number one issue with our members is, is those technical issues about getting back into the air, which the SFAR is going to help relieve. Um, we also had some psychological issues where people were unsure with COVID as to, is it okay to fly? You know, there was just some psychological, you, know, you, you talk to them and say, you're, you're flying by yourself, get out to the airport, nothing better than, than staying proficient and current. But uh, it was very interesting, the, the overall effects on people from a, from a psychological standpoint. Well, thanks. How are you helping inform and uh, prepare pilots for flying after these long, sometimes long periods of inactivity? Is this any different than brushing up, say, after, uh, after the winter season? Well, Dan, I'd say that, uh, you know, I just finished a, a webinar just a few minutes ago with uh, Rusty Pilots. And we're always constantly working with pilots about Rusty, what does that mean, and how they return to the air. We've really amped up our um, Air Safety Institute webinars and doing those kind of things, reminding people that, you know, it's maybe been more than the normal 60, 90 days. You back it with an instructor if necessary and do some simulator work. But our activity on our website is up over 250%. People are interested about doing the right things. And of course, you got different uh, kind of expectations by state and region of the country. So our website's being used a lot about that. And we're reminding them that if you've been out of the cockpit and you're not current, go get an instructor, get brushed up and be ready to return to the air. Also, some of these airplanes have been sitting around for a while too. So if the airplane has been inactive, take an extra time to do a pre-flight check. Yeah. You know, we have a chapter network, so there's about 800 chapters of, of EA members out across the country, and we, we do a lot with them in encouraging them to virtually continue to meet, uh, use the materials that we have for our IMC clubs and, and uh, BMC clubs to help do that flying, you know, in the hangar, if you will, or on the ground. Uh, again, all of the webinars that are pushed out there, we're continuing to encourage people. That is a fantastic way to, to continue to keep your, your intellectual skills uh, up to speed around flying and around the the things you need to do before you can actually get the airplane out. I, I think it is a little different than the normal winter shutdowns wherever you may be in the country because so much of the country has unlimited flying during the year and this, this certainly shut them down. Right. Uh, we've, we've also kind of added another element to the, the, the checklist, if you will, about getting back into the air, you know, in the, in the sanitization issues because we do fly close to 70,000 young people a year and people are anxious to get their Young Eagle programs back up and flying. Uh, along with the encourage, encouragement of, of do the good checks that you should, you know, your personal checks. How are you feeling? How's your mental, mental state? Are you current? Are your medicals up to speed? Is your airplane up to speed? Mm -hmm. uh, so we've really worked hard on that. And I, I think it's been rewarding, as, as Mark has seen, the uptake in the educational material that's out there is really being consumed in larger quantities than we've ever, ever seen. So I hope that's a, mm -hmm. a shift that's going to stick with us going forward. Mm -hmm. Well, those are great points, you know, and, and, particular, the, the, there is a great bit of the country where uh, GA pilots never stop. And so the idea of uh, dewinterizing is, is foreign or being out of the cockpit for longer than 60 days has never, never happened to them. So that's a completely unique paradigm or new paradigm for them. Um, and you had mentioned uh, about the psychological aspect, Jack. So what are some uh, suggestions or, or strategies that, that you are telling uh, your folks how to deal with those um, and mitigate those stressors that, that, that the COVID-19 has brought on? Yeah, we, you know, we, we really just spend some time encouraging them that if you look at the virus, you look at the protocols that are in place, uh, going to the airport, pulling your airplane out, being by yourself flying uh, does not impact or affect anything. And so kind of, you got to just get over that you aren't doing something that just because your neighbors can't do it, that it, it, it's privileged or different. Uh, if anything, you need to continue to do it so that you can stay proficient. That's very, very important. Yeah, and, and I, I got to say, we, we keep talking about recovery, return to normal. Um, and so returning to normal not only helps people emotionally and, and for their mental health, but getting airplanes up in the sky helps us, helps the FAA, the controllers, um, and helps us um, get back to normal. Well, thanks for those answers. Um, what what changes uh, that that we are seeing do you think are temporary, and and what what are we going to be 
carry, carry with us beyond COVID? Anything um, come to mind? Well, I'd say that the, the interest in aviation, particularly general aviation, uh, is extraordinarily high. We've seen uh, financing for loans for aircraft up 7 to 10% over last year, very good numbers last year. Uh, our number one call we get to our uh, legal panel is how to buy an airplane. We're hearing from flight schools that have been focused on general aviation kind of trainings are, are doing very, very well. Um, so I think people are going to end up using general aviation as a mode of transportation. Uh, and I think it's a permit shift. In some cases, unfortunately, the airlines won't be going to some of those cities. Uh, in some cases, the schedule doesn't work. In some cases, the individual doesn't want to go through the terminal. Um, and it's a pretty exciting time in general aviation to see this kind of permanent, I believe, shift uh, and interest in using general aviation as transportation and recreation as a way to get out there. And we do compete with the boating industry and the RV industry for time and, and investment. And all those industries are doing well right now in spite of the COVID uh, concerns that we all have. So it's a, I, I look forward to a lot of activity. I was in an airport last weekend where the guy had filled up 59 general aviation piston airplanes that day. He can't ever remember doing that 20 years. Wow. A small airport in Wisconsin. That's, uh, that's, pretty, that's pretty amazing. Um, I have uh, corporate questions. I'd like to pivot now to David. Um, do, you have a, do, you have, you, do you have a forecast in mind, David, of, of, for business aviation? Uh, from now, from where we are now through the rest of the calendar year and beyond, what are you thinking um, about business aviation going forward? Well, Dan, first, I want to thank you and Steve um, for setting up this panel and recognizing jet aviation, uh, recognizing general aviation and business aviation. I'm certainly honored to be a representative on this, on this esteemed panel. Uh, as discussed in the opening remarks, the volatility affecting the U.S. aviation industry by covid mirrors the activity decline and impact on the overall business aviation segment. The, ec the employment and economic output of business aviation is contributing over 1.2 million jobs and $250 billion into the U.S. economy. This representation in this segment is as diverse and as widespread as any other industry. It is accumulation of individuals, multi-generation family-owned, private, publicly traded organizations supporting local, regional, and global markets. I frankly cannot be more proud of this industry, how we pull together in times of crisis. In our normal business lives, we are competitors with one another. However, through the in recent normal business lives, we are, the industry weave together a network in support of our customers. We, are, we all possess the passion to pay forward what this industry has brought into our lives. The generous commitment of time and experience and transparency between the regulators, the coalition associations, and the industry allows us to move forward as one, ensuring we stay focused on our core values of safety, compliance, and service. Collaboration amongst the participating members have allowed this segment to ensure the safety of our flying public and all of our hardworking, dedicated, amazing employees. Our customers are some of the most influential people that alter the local, national, and global economy. They have shared with us that they are anxious to get back to flying, and so are our employees all of whom are committed to supporting our core values. As an industry, we are strong and we believe in the unique service we provide to our customers. Everyone is cycling through phases of this pandemic. First, we have all faced the personal fear of this virus. Next, we have confronted the reality of its impact on our business, personnel, and ability to socially interact. Through this, we have grieved, we grieved the unfortunate downsizing of some businesses and loss of our colleagues. As leaders, we must build a strategy for the future that remain flexible, ready to meet the new norm with a fresh perspective and dynamic solutions on hand. From a global perspective, all industries, not just aviation, are keeping a close eye on what's happening. Stock market movements, trade discussions, political and economic changes, the Eurozone outputs are all monitored closely. From a business aviation perspective, the macro trends are somewhat positive, so overall, we remain cautiously optimistic. In our maintenance and repair organizations, they've been extremely busy maintaining airworthiness and readiness of our aircraft. Information obtained through IATA and NARA show interest in new and used aircraft remain strong. People and organizations that own aircraft are holding on to them as strategic assets. Opportunistic new entrants into our market are investing and capitalizing on the anticipated demand of public and charter markets. Any individual 
individual that can afford to fly a plane is shifting to explore charter, fractional, and ownership avenues. Our OEMs are continuing to pursue and upgrade aircraft plat platforms concentrated on, uh, concentrated on uh, our environment with greater fuel efficiencies, prolific utilization of sustainable aviation fuels and materials, and advanced safety technologies. The coalition associations such as Gamma, NADA, and NBAA, as well as our fellow panel representatives from AOPA and EA, EAA have been instrumental in ensuring the voice of the industry is heard by the administration and up on the Hill. Scientists around the world are getting a better understanding of COVID, its transmission characteristics, prevention protocols, and ultimately striving for a vaccine to eradicate this virus. Border restrictions and stay-at-home orders are being lifted that forecast an increase in travel over the coming weeks and months. Let me say this, this industry has a pulse and it's coming back to life. We must not lose sight that we remain in the midst of a global pandemic and it is our obligation to adhere to the protocols and safety measures we have incorporated into our everyday business. We have come down the elevator and we're taking the steps back up. This is a journey. I believe as a panel and as an industry, we stand together in applauding the administration for their actions with impressive speed and agility, sometimes not found in the FAA, that between March and through late April, you were able to address managing and controlling delegation of authority, exemptions and other accommodations, including the SFAR mentioned earlier for 135 operations, as well as other op operating activities, which accommodated our training centers, flight schools, several um, amendments for Part 61 and medical certifications. These actions certainly allowed this industry to operate without these hurdles as we learn to conduct business in the COVID era. Steve and Dan, for these unprecedented actions, we thank you and all the members of the administration. So overall, we feel very cautiously optimistic about the, the future of business aviation. Well, thank you, David. Thank you for that answer. Um, uh, you bring uh, you bring a lot of thoughtful commentary in here on on, on business aviation. It's going to help all of us, not just business aviation. Thank you for that. How are you um, continuing uh, or moderating or or modifying safety focus as as business operations begin ramping up um, after this inactivity? Uh, we we're all nobody's more conscious of this than the FAA about the need after, after putting all of these extensions and waivers and modifications in, and we bring it all back, we gotta, we gotta keep an eye on how we get restarted. How are you looking at that? Well, so absolutely at Jet Aviation, and certainly ingrained in business aviation, safety is always and has always been first priority. Our industry pulled together a number of resources and created COVID safety and operational standards with swift action, vigor, and an exceptional level to towards, towards commitment. Our collaboration and sharing of these best practices amongst the industry and coalition associations, along with the publications from the FAA and EASA, really assisted everyone in, in our industry. At Jet Aviation, we, we have our own global safety team, which has been in place for many years. We have always regarded safety as one of our main core values. Our safety team follows the ever-changing landscape daily, utilizing such resources as the CDC and WHO to ensure that we've always meet the best health and safety practices. Internally, we've created our own specific COVID manual that addresses procedures for flight crew, cabin crew, maintenance technicians, FBO line personnel and passengers, really covering the broad scope of everything from sanitizing our aircraft to passenger and health considerations, uh, interaction and support personnel, what available resources that we have at our disposal, how we handle catering, and travel accommodations for our crew when they're on the road. Additionally, we've equipped our personnel and aircraft with the recommended PPE equipment, such as masks, gloves, aprons, sanitizers, cleaning supplies, UPK, and enhanced medical kits. Today, we're providing a return to flying again brochure to set expectations for our customers. It's gonna look and feel a little bit different when our passengers return to flying. They've been away for a little while. Um, we've also created and openly published it on the internet a virtual emergency operations center in response to COVID that collects all of the various materials from all the different resources and puts it into a centralized single source, allowing not only data aviation, but we've allowed this access to everyone in the industry so, so they can use it for his or her own benefit. Our owners, charter customers, suppliers, and employees can really feel at ease knowing that we have worked really hard to do our best in keeping them safe. 
First and foremost, I think it's creating the awareness and the education about this virus, detailing the specific COVID procedures, documenting your quarantine protocols, Tech technological solutions and protective barriers are implemented throughout JIT Aviation in order to combat and mitigate the risk of every passenger and employee and vendor entering any one of our facilities or our aircraft. You mentioned earlier about a safety management system. Our safety management system is supported by a dedicated staff of cast members as well as safety members have been truly a blessing and, in, and instrumental in identifying the organizational flight and maintenance risks as well as assisting us with predicting how prepared we are for the increase in activity and return back to normal levels. Additionally, we've taken the time to explore ex report extracts from our FOQA program to measure the effectiveness of our operations and training programs. This allows us to adjust accordingly for any media trends or re on renewed flight activity. All of this data, as you mentioned earlier, is being de-identified and shared throughout the community and specifically to the FAA's aviation safety information analysis uh, sharing program. So David, thank you. Um, and, I, and, and I'm sorry if I'm interrupting. I'm just so conscious of the time and how many people we have on this call. So okay. that, that is uh, certainly a fulsome answer. And, I, and we appreciate that, in, that uh, insight and that input. Um, I would like to um, transition, if we could, to the rotorcraft side of, uh, of the sector and talk to Jay Lynn for just a minute here. Um, Jalen, how has your organization seen increased stress, uh, as we've already talked about, on helicopter pilots due to the changes in operations, especially, I would think, for the air ambulance services? And you're muted. I'm sorry, I thought we were gonna control the muting and unmuting for you, for you all, so I apologize for that. Go ahead, Jalen. Can you hear me now? Yep. Great. Uh, so, yes, as you said, in Air Ambulance, we are an essential service during this time. And um, we call ourselves, sometimes we talk about it as a flying ICU. And our crews consist of a pilot and two clinicians. And I think one of the biggest changes or stresses that we've seen is that for the first time, I think our pilots have really had to acknowledge and come to grips with the fact that they are also healthcare providers in addition to you know, the risk management that they provide for aviation. And that's a pretty significant you know, psychological, emotional shift to think of yourself that way. They've always been participating in those transports and saving lives. Um, and we do you know, transport other contagious patients, but this is the first time where they've had to you know, all participate in something very close. And I think we've seen the natural concerns, concerns about, you know, am I gonna take this home to my family? And then also variation. So we've got you know, part of our, our pilots that are pretty, um, they're pretty cavalier, like, you know, nothing's going to happen to me. I, you know, I'm invincible. And then we have others who maybe veer on the side where they're also a little bit too cautious. So I think leading through this, it's been important um, for our team to listen really carefully um, and to understand how people are feeling. We've offered, you know, some different lead programs for people who, you know, fall into some of the high risk demographics. Um, and then really putting in consistent um, communication. So we, we feel like following the CDC guidelines has been a really good foundation to refer back to. It's always consistent and it's the same message coming out. And I think that consistency has really helped our team adapt to what could be a very substantial stress. So we're pretty proud of what they've done and um, the lives they've been able to save through the work they've been doing. Well, thanks. Are you finding that you have to make any changes to maintain the safety culture or is it just efforts to, to try to hold on to the status quo? No, we've, we've made some fairly significant changes right out of the gate. Um, just for reference, we've transported about 1,800 um, people that have, are potential COVID patients, about just under 600 that are actually have been fully confirmed. And so right out of the gate, we started, we stood up our emergency response center, which we think has been um, a real uh, success in this. So it created a single point of contact for any questions coming from the pilots. Um, it also created a single reference for information as they wanted to look up information, get information. Um, that was daily. I started, you know, we started doing a, an, a CEO email that was very well received, trying to get that information consistently out to the team. And so I think that's one thing. Um, the other thing that I'm really proud of our team is we moved very quickly to make sure that we had adequate 
personal protective gear for everyone to wear, including the pilots. And there was a moment, I think, where it took a lot of trust um, from our teams, because in those early days, while we had the supply chain, chain team really scouring the world, quite frankly, for PPE, um, we asked all of our bases to send in their personal protective gear into a centralized warehouse so that based on the volume of flights they were taking, um, that we could redistribute that so that we could make sure every crew had full PPE gear. So just think about that for a second. You're kind of out in a remote base and someone says, hey, take those extras and send them in and trust that you know, the corporate's gonna send this back to you. And what I love is that our pilots and our teams, they, they did, they sent them in, it worked, um, we redistributed and we've been able to have full PPE gear for everyone on the flight, for all the flights that we've been taking. And, and at this point, we've kept our crew safe um, and we haven't had people get infected despite transporting so many COVID patients. So our whole focus on PPE, I think was a really um, big success. The other thing that I think we did from a safety perspective to innovate is our, our patient safety team um, has been very supportive of our field teams and our pilots. And they've created the standard criteria, like when someone has been exposed for you know, low, medium and high risk and what the quarantine or what the behavior is um, for that. So that's kept that consistent as well. Um, and I think given a certain level of comfort and focus on the mission of flying safely. So, Pretty, pretty happy. I think there will be more that we need to do. And I know you kind of talked a little bit with Jack and Mark about sharing data. Um, we've done that on the rotor side as well through AMOA. We, early on our team started exchanging data to understand what people were seeing and to be able to adapt. And so that's mm -hmm. been a really positive thing for our industry as well and to have that organization to help us do that. No, thanks Jalen. I'll ask you the same thing I asked uh, the other panelists. Um, in, in the in the rotorcraft world, what what are you seeing for the projections of operations going forward? Is it, as I said earlier, you're almost back to, to where you were, um, and uh, it, do you do you see that changing at all for the rest of the year? Uh, so you're right. We've returned basically to normal volumes, pretty much. It's there's a little bit of difference depending on region of the country. I, I think it's hard to predict what a second or a third wave might look like or how people will respond. Um, we do see that any sort of mobility in the population, it really drives the type of transports that we do. So I think without you know, further massive shutdowns that we probably will see that stay close through the end of the year. I, I think it's overall, we're adapting to what's just a new normal um, for the business and for how we operate with our employees. So we've been making more permanent investments um, in PPE. We've purchased, it's a, they're called Genentech masks. They're basically a permanent filter. They're more comfortable for the pilots to wear. So we're evolving, I think, our business in ways like that, just assuming that life is never gonna be exactly what it was before, but I think it can be better and people can be safe mm -hmm. and we can do the missions we're out there to do. Yeah, I, I would think of all the sectors of GA, the air ambulance side would be the closest to sort of the, in, the, in the COVID environment, not huge changes because um, nurses and flight crews have to take uh, medical precautions with, with, uh, with passengers one way or the other. Um, so I, I guess that would be a, a, a fairly smooth transition. Um, you know, we talked in the last town hall about, about airline commercial aviation, as goes commercial aviation, uh, so goes hotels and rental cars, other you know slices and sectors of the economy. Um, is there anything sort of, uh, and this is for all the my panelists. Is there, it, are there sectors of the um, of the of the economy outside of GA that GA activity has a direct bearing on that is impacted um, and has been impacted by reduced GA activity? I mean, I think of FBOs, um, but is there is there anything else? Uh, um, that, that we should be watching um, or is dependent on the year full recovery? Jack? I'll start off with, go ahead, Jack. Mark? I, I think the, uh, the maintenance side, certainly, you know, there were a lot of shops that just uh, flat shut down, uh, especially early in the or end of March, early of May. So we've got to keep a close eye on that, getting them back up and running. I think the other thing that we've got to make sure we as a collective industry do effectively is while there has been some some near-term 
damage, if you will, that aviation as a whole continues to be a, a growth industry to be in. Uh, the need for technicians, the need for pilots, in spite of the, the ramp down at the airlines with the number of retirements. If you look at the numbers at American and Delta and Southwest with the early retirement option, they have basically quickly taken away what became a, uh, an extra supply of pilots to getting back onto where there's going to be a, be a shortage very quickly. So we've got some work to do to, to, to tell our story. And I do think um, what we're seeing at the OPA side is people are making trips, um, whether it's to you know remote locations in the backcountry flying or, or to business trips. People are flying further in the piston and, and light turbine aircraft uh, than they had been. Um, we're, we're just seeing that kind of activity, which helps the rental car business and the hotel business and other things like that. But in many cases, they are making the round trip in the same day. So I think we can have a small impact on the on the hotel and restaurant and car rental business, but um, the GA activity itself, the FBO, Avgas side, is doing really well. But Dan, I think in the FBO side, of course, and in areas of the country that have been most affected, have been most, those FBOs have been most impacted. So when you look at areas like New York and LA, which is certainly a hot spot of activity, not only in the COVID area, but also uh, for business jet ac aircraft activity, we need to get those markets back up, and up online and see people start moving through those regions. New York, New Jersey, Connecticut is just moving into phase two. So we're starting to get some traction in the New York area. New, uh, California has opened up last week as well. So we see that we, we believe that there's gonna be some increase in activity on the both coasts. Um, and of course, there's other states that have opened up as well, but the concern is, is some of the inflated numbers of, of confirmed COVID cases in those states that have opened up uh, that are concerning people to travel back to those destinations. Okay, well, well, thanks for those answers. And, uh, you know, that sort of concludes the, the questions I had for y'all. We're gonna, um, I'm gonna hand it back to Brianna, uh, see if we've got any, uh, any questions um, from, our, from our participants or other participants. Brianna, do we have anything? Thanks, Dan, we do. Um, joining the live stream today, we have Ed Bolin, president and CEO of NBAA. And he has asked, he has this following question for the FAA specifically. Congress and the FAA have been helpful in addressing critical needs for our industry during the COVID-19 public health emergency. As COVID-19 continues, what leadership can we expect from the FAA in terms of continued support for affected operational and regulatory considerations as we continue to confront unexpected challenges in the COVID-19 environment? So um, from a regulator's perspective, um, we thus far have not, uh, obviously the CARES Act, right, uh, has been, um, uh, in its, its various iterations, have been a huge player in uh, economic uh, recovery and, and sustainability, really. I, I don't even know if I could call it recovery, but, but the CARES Act has um, been targeted and we, the FAA, uh, working with the Department of Treasury, um, uh, had a had a big say and role in uh, the best use of those of those funds and how they how they would be distributed. Um, on the regulatory side, um, we have somewhere in the neighborhood of about eighty, I would say, um, different um, regulatory enhancements that help uh, the industry, as as Ed was pointing out, um, in many different ways. And, and both Mark and Jack uh, opened with these um, the the relaxation of, of some requirements that understand the, uh, uh, the reduction in flying. Um, going forward, uh, I think the burden or the onus is really going to be uh, twofold. It's going to be on us, the regulator, to unfold, to un unravel um, these various regulatory uh, mitigations that we put in place um, uh, to do it in a thoughtful way, right? We don't want to lift um, the, the writ large, the the extension on medical so that everybody um, um, goes non-current on the same day, right? We can't handle that. So we're gonna un unravel it in a way that makes sense that, that, that the flight docs can handle and the, and, and, uh, the pilots can handle and the, and the different operations. Um, but it's two part because we have to unravel in a thoughtful way, but operators, maintainers, manufacturers also have to be very careful and thoughtful in how they get themselves ready and, and re-engage in normal operations. So it's, uh, 
it's really going to be a community effort. I appreciate Ed's question very much, um, and uh, would 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 comment that between the two panels, uh, I think MBAA is extremely well represented today. Um, but uh, yeah, and I'm not I'm not sure if I if I captured um, all of uh, uh, in its entirety Ed's question. But uh, if anybody wants to weigh in, please feel free. No one wants to weigh in. We have another question from Chuck. Uh, this is for all the panelists. As a pilot, who's, what is the most important thing I should consider when I go flying this weekend? I, I could start out with that from uh, Mark Baker and AOPA's perspective is make sure that you are working to be as safe as possible and that you are ready for the weather, the aircraft is ready for the mission and check it over one more time. We'll just take a little extra time on your pre-flight making sure that the pilot and the plane are ready for that particular mission. Uh, but we believe the more you fly, the safer you are. So get out there and fly. We'd also add in, if you have any kind of uh, apprehension, take a CFI, take a safety pilot, take a friend. Great, great advice. Um, There's nothing else on that one. I can move on to our next question. Um, from David, he is asking, with the imposition of social distancing, has the GA community developed any guidance or recommendations to minimize exposure and thus virus transmissions among the GA community? And this is for the entire panel. I can start out again because we have at AOPA uh, published on our website, uh, how do you return to safe flight? What, you, what precautions you might wanna think of for doing flight training? and how that the plane should be cleaned and what kind of uh, expectations you should mutually have and discuss uh, exactly that, you know, if you're not feeling well today, don't come to the airport for your flight lesson today. Uh, all those kind of basic things are listed out uh, in a very good digestible format for both the flight school, the pilot, passenger, or the student. So visit the website. Great, thank you, Mark. Dan, this next question I think is best for you to answer. Um, this question is about medical certificates. My medical certificate expired in May. The FAA extended the validity of the certificate until June 30th. Will it be extended again? So we, we are in the process, actually, I think that there is um, uh, a rule going through um, uh, the proper channels right now. And uh, we are going to, I think for those, I think for those um, expiring the end of May, they're going to get 30 to 60 day extension. Uh, but I, I don't know if we have um, um, monitoring on the town hall right now, the, the right ABS person to, to answer that. But um, tell, and what was the name of the, the questioner who, who asked the question, Bree? Dan. Dan asked Dan, huh? Dan asking Dan. <laughs> um, well, please let's 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 uh, get back to Dan. That that will um, have a, a more firm response from us than and for the community than than here. Um, I do know that that uh, an extension is in the works um, if if it hasn't uh, gone through already um, with an extension. Um, and again, what what we're hoping is that very soon, in as we go through the summer, that we'll actually be sort of unraveling um, those extensions and getting people back into getting, um, you know, getting their currency, getting their, getting their medicals. Um, but uh, yeah, we are, we are going to extend um, beyond May, beyond June 30th. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, this question is for Jet Aviation and others, if you have anything to add. Um, will the COVID-19 situation boost the potential for illegal charters, do you believe? Well, the FAA does, has done a great job in the industry, self-polices itself relative to illegal charters. Uh, so I don't believe that it'll open up opportunities for illegal charters. I think that there are new entrants into the marketplace that are really looking to capitalize on private and charter opportunities. Uh, they're aligning themselves with the right people, getting the right legal representation for it. So I don't believe that that is the case for it. I think people are investing heavily into uh, private aviation and will continue to do so. Great. 
This next one is for you, Jalen. How has your organization's approach to promoting safety culture changed during this period of increased and unfamiliar operations? So I would say, you know, we have been um, rapidly adopting SMS and um, implementing that. And so that has been a huge help to, you know, what we've done. So I would say it's operations as usual. I think that, you know, the change management and the focus on wearing PPE um, and some of those changes have probably been some of the biggest focus, as well as the appropriate categorization, you know, when an exposure has happened and what type of quarantine should happen and how do we take care of people at that point. Great, thank you. Um, here's another question from Steve to AOPA and EAA. Uh, my son is about to begin his freshman year at Bowling Green State University in the aviation major to become a professional pilot. How do you see the recovery unfolding over the next four years in the industry for airline and corporate pilots? I'll take a start with that first and Jack can uh, probably give you the right answer. But I think it's a, a good time to be in aviation still. Uh, there's going to be lots of different opportunities. Uh, maybe being a flight instructor for some of these GA people that are coming along. Uh, it's going to be a, an initial career. By the way, the military is still short thousands of pilots. Uh, there are going to be big opportunities in every facet of aviation. Some are going to be growing faster back. I think general aviation, business aviation may have a little faster growth back than airlines for a while. Uh, but I'm very confident that people are going to continue to move around this country and globe. Yeah, I couldn't agree with more. And if you look at all the data that's out there, I mean, we're going to get a vaccine at some point here. The airlines are going to get back to the, the traffic patterns that they've had, their traffic loads that they've had, uh, they're talking about that being probably less than two years. Uh, he couldn't be timing it better. I think he's going to go through the program and come out with it, all of those opportunities that we had last year. Great. Jalen, someone just asked if you could repeat the name of the pilot mask that you mentioned in your last answer. I'm probably going to say, now I'm wondering if I'm saying it wrong, but it's Genentech, G-E-N-E-N-T-C-H. Great, thank you. We have a question from a local DC area pilot. Um, what is the best way for me to report an issue that I am seeing related to COVID-19? This is for anyone who wants to jump in there. I think Dan mentioned that early on and it's the right answer is you know, the, the self-reporting system. If there are issues that are related to um, safety flight, uh, it's always the best way to use those NASA forms and get on there and um, submit those. Certainly we stand by at the Pilots uh, Information Center to take those as well. If there's something we can be involved in and help either guide or educate, we wanna be helpful. That wraps it up for the questions that we've received. Um, thank you so much to all of our panelists on panel one. We are going to transition to our second panel now. And I think that um, our tech folks will initiate live feeds from our panelists on panel two. And again, thank you everyone on panel one for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Brianna. I'd like to introduce Bruce DeClean, director of the FAA's Office of Safety Standards, part of Brianna's been muted. Sorry, I was introducing Bruce. Um, as with panel one, the moderate, moderator will lead the discussion and then take some questions from the participants. And then we will uh, ask the participants some questions from our audience. Great. Thank you, Brianna. And thank you to Administrator Dixon and Deputy Administrator Elwell uh, and to the first panel for so uh, eloquently laying out the groundwork for this panel which we're gonna call Operational Experiences Through COVID, Aircraft, Airports, and Infrastructure. Safe flight relies on the contributions of numerous people before the flight uh, represented uh, across this panel. Administrator Dixon spoke to the principles of SMS and, and aviation related on the application of safety risk management by everyone involved and on the procedures for how we do our work. Operational experience in April illustrates how complex the job of safety has become for all of us in the era. In this case, by protecting themselves from one hazard, contracting and spreading a potentially deadly virus, an airline flight crew unintentionally set up an incident that could have had a deadly result. According to a NASA aviation safety report, 
um, the pilots were in cruise flight when they smelled and saw smoke from the center pedestal in the cockpit. They donned their masks, expedited the path to an airport, landed and shut down. Later, maintenance control revealed the suspected cause. <coughs> Alcohol from wipes used to clean and sanitize the cockpit shorted out wires in the center console. According to the report, the mechanic said the same thing had happened on several aircraft. This incident highlights the process we undergo every time there are changes in aviation and new risks to be identified. Companies and individuals are experiencing change at an unprecedented rate while promoting public health, introducing new vulnerabilities that we know about, and probably many more we have yet to identify. We must mitigate those risks while allowing aviation to continue to play its essential role in society. Each new risk and each new mitigation may have potential unintended consequences as illustrated in the example of the alcohol wipes. As you all know, and was mentioned in the first panel, we at the FAA have been managing the balance between providing greater operational flexibility for health and essential operations and ensuring an acceptable level of aviation safety for general aviation. In late April, we issued the revisions that were referenced in the, in the SFAR, uh, Special Federal Regulations, to grant certain regulatory relief for medicals, knowledge tests, CFI renewals, flight reviews, instrument currency. The, the, downside, the downside of regulatory relief is that we have to up our game to make sure we don't have a repeat of the wet wipe experience. During the airline town hall, one international carrier noted that one of its biggest challenges in op is operating in the environment of changing regulations and unique procedures. This new environment we're in requires vigilance from everyone to check our experience and stop and ask, with the situation today, are there new risks? We need to look for unusual trends or things that seem anomalous, things you hadn't expected before. That same national carrier said this, there's a desire sometimes to dismiss those trends as outliers, but unfortunately, outliers can become new trends if you're not paying attention. I'd like to introduce our panel for our deep dive into airworthiness and operational support experiences in the midst of COVID-19. With us are Ron Draper, President and CEO of Textron Aviation, Tony Lafave, President and COO of Signature Aviation, Aaron Hickman, President and CEO Duncan Aviation, and Joel Bacon, Executive Vice President, Government and Public Affairs, American Association of Airport Executives, or as we all more commonly refer to, AAAE. Uh, welcome to you all, and I'm going to start with some questions. I'll direct the question to one of you in particular, uh, but to everybody on the panel, you are all experts, um, so if you have something to, to add or to jump in the conversation, please feel free to do so. And with that, I'm going to ask a first general question, and uh, Aaron, I'll, I'll direct it to you first, uh, and then give uh, others a chance to, to also uh, share their perspective. As I mentioned, uh, we are facing a lot of change and, and change can in, in incur risk. Um, just thinking about change, what, what changes do you or your organization see have occurred uh, or, or predict will, will occur uh, for general aviation through the remainder of the year? Aaron? Sure, um, as I think as the previous panel talked about, the, the reduction in hours have occurred, the flying hours, we have started to see some of those pick up the, the distinction I would make is on the jet side, we've seen the small and mid-sized jets pick up a little bit at a, a higher percentage of flying than the large and ultra-large. And I think that's because the international flying has uh, decreased. Um, uh, you know, especially Asia, Europe, we've seen a significant reduction there, UK because of the quarantine rules of getting back to the country. Um, so, so I think anytime you have the economy uh, shut down and then you have flying hours down, uh, your, it, it impacts our, our industry. And um, the biggest way we see it, first of all, is on discretionary spending. So we saw a reduction in uh, the spend for interiors and avionics. Uh, today, if they do spend something for uh, avionics, we see it more in the Wi-Fi area or in uh, maybe an ionization of, uh, machine, something that can uh, make the aircraft safer. safer. So I think um, uh, as we talk to customers, we, we uh, understand that some of them as they, they're flying will pick up, they feel like more of the middle managers will be flying with them, uh, where maybe the middle managers were flying commercial and the senior execs were flying 
on the aircraft. So I think that could help the industry um, as, as it continues to grow. We've seen a few more people uh, increase the charter uh, flights, people that maybe could afford a charter before, but were flying commercial. So I think that's positive. So I think, you know, I think it's going to be a slow growth, but um, uh, we do, uh, you know, it did impact us in the short term. And um, I think we've all kind of reset our costs so that we can uh, be competitive and then obviously focus on all the safety protocols. So for a while there, since we never shut down, we were working very quickly to uh, whether it was the mask or whether it was creating the, getting the hand sanitizers out and the, the, all the communication out. So it was almost like going through a recession throwing with the addition of the safety protocol at the same time. Uh, but it was, um, uh, I think an exercise, I think our industry responded well to. Great, thanks, Aaron. Um, I, I think that that uptick in uh, some of the types of operations is an echo from the first panel. So I, I, that, that's interesting. Um, Ron, how about you? Thanks, Chair sure, Bruce. Uh, thanks for the invite to be on the panel today. And thanks for the FAA for, for setting it up. You know, the, the impact from the virus has been significant, like it has for most companies. Um, you know, initially there was the fear of not the unknown of the virus and, and how are we gonna get people away from each other? How are we gonna build airplanes, service airplanes? How are we gonna work in this new world? And then it was economically, it was going from uh, you know, highway speed to full stop in terms of the uncertainty. Uh, and so we, we've been wrestling with both. Uh, we made a decision early on, we, we stopped our production lines for about eight weeks nobody was thinking of buying a new airplane, you know, in uh, late March or April or May. Uh, and, and we wanted to uh, reset all our protocols in our factories about how we're going to work and, and change the way we build airplanes. So, so we kind of full stop production. Uh, we kept maintaining airplanes and our service and support networks out there, but just like most companies, it was pretty significant as we're returning to work and we're largely back to work across the board, you know, we are encouraged uh, seeing flying pick up significantly. Uh, as discussed in the earlier panel, you know, piston flying was pretty resilient throughout the period, but business aviation to include turboprops was, was down significantly. We're seeing that pick up, that's encouraging. Uh, you know, overhanging the industry though is economic uncertainty. So there are signs for optimism, you know, uh, about how this, uh, this pandemic is maybe positive for general aviation as a way, uh, as a means for travel and getting the country back to work and travel in a, a more controlled manner. And that's, that's positive. Maybe the opposing force is just the economic uncertainties that, that's out there. Uh, but, but I remain positive on, on the, the nature of the, the economy for general aviation. I do think we're seeing demand pick up in, in our charter customers. Um, and, and uh, we're seeing uh, the used airplane uh, values very, very stable. Companies are holding on to their airplanes, are looking to pick up an additional airplanes. So there's a lot of positives for, for GA going forward um, as we're all trying to figure out how to work, you know, in this, this new environment. Thanks, Ron. I know, um, I know for all the owner, existing owners of, of your aircraft, um, one thing on their mind is, any impact to the cost support uh, that you all provide. Can you just sort of focus in on that and talk about how you sustain that? The, did you say the cost support? Yeah, continuous, the continuous operational safety support. Oh yes, absolutely. There'll be no, no, be no uh, impact to that. We, we are, are keeping um, you know, all our technical support, all our safety and engineering support, all our service centers remained open this entire time. And, and we have not even um, removed one dollar from supporting our customers in flight. Uh, and most companies are out there reducing costs. We're, we're doing the same, but um, that's more around discretionary spending and what's the future look like and, and shows and the like. But uh, when it comes to the customers and safety and the technical needs of their airplanes, uh, no, we're, we're full in on that. Great. Fantastic. Thanks, Ron. Uh, uh, Joel, I know Signature must have seen a broad variety of impacts uh, to G GA. Uh, what are your thoughts? Tony, you want to grab that? 
Bruce, you said uh, Joel was signature. Uh, I oh, assume I'm, that I'm, was uh, that was aimed at Tony. He's the most, I'm sorry. He's the much I'm, more I'm, handsome I'm, of the two of us. So <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that, Tony. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Um, so we've seen similar things, I think, across volumes dropped 85 percent sort of into the crisis. The majority of the traffic we were doing was related to um, moving folks at first responders, moving critical PPE supplies, a lot of stuff coming through our Alaska operations uh, you know, via Alaska from China. And so, you know, we saw a massive uptick in, in that kind of traffic. Uh, and then repatriation flights too. We did a lot of work for uh, cruise lines as they were stuck and stranded across the, the world. Now that traffic's dropped off and now we're starting to see the majority of the businesses around leisure traffic or personal travel. Um, we haven't seen corporate come back as much as uh, obviously before the crisis. So we see a big pop sort of on the weekends. Um, and you know, as states are beginning to open and we're starting to see some of the, the traffic, um, excuse me, the, uh, the cities and businesses open, we're starting to see that come back. So again, sort of similar um, trends that everybody's seeing. We're encouraged, certainly it's getting back certainly a lot quicker than our, our friends on the commercial side. Um, you know, another question we get asked a lot is, hey, how do I, you know, fly private? Uh, I think there's a lot of interest. I'm not sure how much that's resulted in actual people flying, though, because I think once people sort of hear the cost, there is some cost prohibitive, but uh, certainly a lot of interest and a lot of people asking us how they get into private flying. And so we're trying to do our best to tie them in with uh, the various operators around um, the country. Um, so I think that's, you know, where we're seeing sort of as it is for now, I think through the main day of the year, uh, we think trends are going to come back. I'm not sure until there's a vaccine, we're going to see it fully return. Um, but everything we've seen so far is, is pointing in the right direction. It's just how quick the recovery is, is anybody's um, sort of guess at this point. All right. Uh, thanks, Tony. And I'll, I'll, I'll make it up to Joel. Uh, <laughs> you get to back clean up on that question. Uh, how, how about you from an airport perspective? Yeah, the problem is bat and cleanup, all the smart people have already spoken about this. So uh, let me just talk briefly about the airport perspective. It's, it's really remarkable to think that it's been basically 100 days that we've been dealing with the uh, fallout from the first kind of days of the virus hitting uh, and the depths that we went through and have gone to. Uh, and hopefully, as everyone has indicated, we're on an uptrend, uh, but we've had some pretty difficult uh roads to navigate along the way. I want to start off by saying, you know, I, I a tremendous shout out, Bruce, to you, to the FAA, uh, to Administrator Dixon, Deputy Administrator Elwell, and from our perspective, the amazing airports office team, Kurt Schaefer, Winsome Linford, their team, the, uh, we are in uncharted waters, obviously, the level of collaboration and communication uh, as we've worked our way through operational issues, economic issues has really been tremendous. And that government uh, private partnership uh, is what's going to sustain us. It's gotten us through these hundred days and it's what's going to gives us all optimism that we're going to get there moving forward. Uh, as everyone has said, we're seeing an uptick, uh, particularly on the general aviation side. We have airports, obviously, at uh, commercial service and general aviation airports in our membership. Uh, the depth on the commercial side, uh, you know, in April, it was down 96%. Uh, we didn't dip quite that low on the general aviation side, obviously, but the impacts are significant and uh, a lot of them are economic that uh, we're going to spend an awful lot of time as an airport community dealing with and tackling as we move forward. Uh, you're dealing with uh, the same sort of operational costs if you're an airport operator and a period of time where revenue has fallen off of the cliff and a very uncertain path moving forward with an awful lot more questions than there are answers. So how do you plan for that? How do you deal with staffing issues? How do you deal with projects that you have ongoing? How do you deal with managing maintenance of costly and complicated projects? Uh, a couple of the previous speakers have talked about workforce issues, and I think those are significant across the aviation industry. How do you keep the technicians and the operational professionals and the young people 
that we all want to see uh, part of this industry and that are so critical to it th thriving long term. How do we keep them engaged when you have the economic hardships that you have before us? And I think those are hardships that are 2020 hardships and probably longer sustaining. So we have a lot of challenges before us. I think we're all optimistic that we're on an uptick uh, looking forward. We've got great people in the industry. We've got great leaders at the FAA. So uh, it's been a dip, but I think we're uh, on the right path and hoping uh, we continue on that moving forward. Great. Um, thanks to all of you for sort of painting the, the, the backdrop of, of the environment. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, ask a few questions that really get to maybe some of the, the risk areas where we're experiencing change uh, and, and really talk about what do you see and, and what, uh, what are you doing uh, to help and communicate uh, management of those risks. Um, so let's start in the airport environment. Um, so uh, the airport environment has experienced a, a lot of change. Uh, there certainly have been a a fewer movements in the shorter term, uh, closed services, uh, uh, fuel not always available when it was expected or was closed, um, some ATC closures, uh, as you saw the FAA had, had announced, uh, uh, increase in the number of parked air airplanes as commercial uh, operators park airplanes, uh, sometimes in unusual places. Uh, are there any additional concerns pilots and operators should take into consideration bef before flying into an airport, whether familiar or unfamiliar uh, during this time? Um, uh, uh, let's uh, try Joel and, and then Tony. Well, I think you hit on a lot of the challenges that uh, the pilot community, the operator community is going to have to be cognizant of moving forward as you fly uh, throughout the system, which of course we all hope continues to happen robustly. Uh, there are an awful lot of changes. The pace of change is rapid. And so I think it's incumbent on every operator to do the due diligence and the homework to understand what is happening, uh, whether it is ATC closures. You know, we've got uh, almost 90 towers that have had hours altered. And that's been a, a good process that we worked out with FAA, great communication on that. But the fact is we've got hours that are evolving. Uh, they're changing sometimes on a daily basis in some cases, depending on what's happening. You've got uh, at the local airports, uh, the staffing issues, which as I mentioned with the budget situation, you have airports that have had to furlough uh, employees or cut back on hours, which has an impact on services, obviously. Uh, you mentioned the parked aircraft, uh, particularly at commercial service airports. There are 2,000 airplanes parked around the system right now. Uh, thankfully, there are only a handful where they are on runways, but they're on a lot of other surfaces on the airport. And again, those situations change. The FAA has got good information on their website. Um, the other issue I would highlight, Bruce, is you've got local health concerns and local health requirements and quarantine uh, issues that we've seen where traffic coming in from one area of the, of the country has quarantine uh, rules and requirements that they have to follow. So it's a rapidly evolving situation. Uh, I think the advice that I would offer to everyone is uh, make sure that you're doing your due diligence on the front end to check in at the airport at which you're operating and that you hope to operate. I think the things, as I've said multiple times here, are moving so quickly that what you thought was true yesterday and today may not, in fact, be the case by the time you arrive uh, at your destination airport. So making sure you just have situational awareness of how rapidly things are changing uh, in the air with air traffic and the air traffic control towers and on the ground with rules and services, I think it's just critical given where we are right now. And I don't think that that is going to change anytime soon. Great, thanks. So just really understanding that the bar environment is changing and doing that right pre-flight planning and taking advantage of all those tools. Um, Tony, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so um, a little bit sort of, we were in that situation around sort of the first of the crisis. I think as we've started to open up, all of our facilities are now open um, under their normal operating hours, which is typically 24 hours. Um, and that uh, will be fully staffed or full complement of staffing by July 6th. So we're in the process of actually recalling um, some additional workers that we had uh, put on temporary furlough. So, you know, 
again, another trend and another indicator that things are coming back to normal. Um, like all of our operations now fully functioning. Um, again, sort of tower restrictions, as were pointed out, still remain. But as a facility, um, we're able to accept all arrivals now and uh, through seven by 24 hour operations. Um, the biggest change we're seeing uh, is a lot of our sort of how do we deal with the various local county, government, cities, um, state restrictions on what you should do to operate a business. Ironically, we operated, of course, throughout all of the COVID crisis. Uh, however, they're now opening up restaurants and they're opening up all these other businesses. And as they're doing that, they're putting on restrictions um, or they're putting in new rules. And so we're having to comply with a lot of local um, ordinances and you know the typical one or the one that's be, you know becoming sort of the standard now is mask wearing um, we mandated early on very early in the process we uh, we acquired a bunch of n95 masks um, and had been requiring our team to wear them uh, so we already and will continue to do that so that is meeting most of the city requirements there is some additional requirements on uh, spacing inside of the facility. So we've actually just rolled out a program that has, you know, social distancing markers throughout the facility. Some are requiring traffic lanes, so you can only go in one way, come out the other. All of that has been incorporated where we're required to, um, but most part, we're trying to keep a standard so you're familiar with what the process is. So if you fly through a signature uh, on one end, when you land in another one, it'll look the same and feel the same. And of course, we're, uh, as our employees come to work every day, a new requirement for them, they're getting uh, health checked. So they go through a questionnaire, their temperatures checked. Um, and if they default on any of those questions, we put them into uh, an area where they can do some telemedicine and uh, they take the outcome and we honor and let them go home if they need to, to, uh, to quarantine. Uh, but, so we're taking sort of very proactive actions with our team uh, we've been very lucky. We've uh, we've had very few employees, uh, less than 10 out of 4,500 total globally uh, that have had the virus. So we've been very, very fortunate that uh, we've been able to keep the virus out of our operation. And that's, you know, a testament to all of our team, but certainly some of the practices that we put in place early on. Um, and we'll continue to do that and make sure that we're looking after uh, the health and safety of not only our team, but then our customers ultimately. Um, okay, great. Uh, thank you, Tony. So, I'm, I'm, to me, that that, that really illustrates what it what it means to be in the current environment where we're achieving aviation safety and public health at the same time, and and uh, significant commitments are are really required for both of those objectives. Yeah, Bruce, could could I make a quick comment on? Uh, yeah, yeah. I was just going to add a different perspective. Love what Joel and, and Tony had to say, but. Uh, there's also opportunity right now. So just a couple of nights ago, I was out uh, doing night training and landings and I took a small airplane of Bonanza up to Kansas City International. Rarely do I go up there. The traffic is so light. It's a great opportunity to go to some of these busier places and get familiar and do training. And I was at Kansas City International and there was myself and a 172 in the traffic pattern at Kansas City International. And, uh, so there's opportunities out there to do training for GA pilots at some of these busy places, get familiar. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the tower controller thanked me up there saying, I think they were a little bored for coming in and doing some work at the airport. So for all the GA pilots, uh, now's a great time to get out and do some training at some of these places. I think that's a great, great point, Ron. I've heard similar anecdotes. Um, and despite the change on, on the surface, I don't think we've seen any significant increase. I, I just checked this morning on, on runway incursions and uh, certainly traffic is down, but, but this May to the, to the previous May, um, uh, they've dropped from 152, 152 to 58 in the month of May. And so there isn't really any indicator at this time. Uh, I think as we look at the data, we're, we're monitoring that and data is essential. Uh, but, but we're monitoring that and, and uh, folks do seem to be managing that change well. Um, I, I'd like to talk to Aaron and Ron a little bit about uh, aircraft uh, maintenance. Um, uh, really shift a little bit and, and recognize that a safe flight starts with a safe aircraft. Um, what, what are your organizations doing to help operators ensure that aircraft returning to service are airworthy? 
especially for aircraft that have been parked for extended periods of time. And, you know, there's a little bit of discussion about this topic in the first panel and how, how important it is. Uh, 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 Dan talked about um, uh, dewinterizing and, and that being a new phenomena in much of the country where they never experienced a winter before. Um, so what, what are you seeing and, and what are you all doing in terms of uh, uh, aircraft safety and, and, and maintenance? Uh, Aaron, how about we start with you and then uh, Ron, I'll shift it over to you. Sure. The vast, the vast majority of our customers that we've seen, even if they have not flown for 60 days, they are keeping the aircraft ready to fly at any time. So they understand the uh, engine um, policies of, of running the engines every 30 days and they're, they're following those procedures. And in fact, many of our customers are, you know, to also keep their pilots current are, are, are doing some, um, even if it's just around the, the airport to keep the aircraft exercised and they're, they're doing that. Our, our own flight department is exercising each one of our aircraft and our managed aircraft uh, at least once a month, uh, whether they're flying or not. And, and so I think our, our industry, at least on the business aviation uh, uh, segment, um, I think they're, they're well um, um, situated to um, uh, start flying. And, you know, we, we've, we have 30 avionics facilities. We have 18 engine rapid response teams around the country. Uh, I think uh, I, I pulled them yesterday, and I think there was one aircraft that had been for sale for four months that had, um, you know, the flight department had been let go and, and they hadn't uh, exercised the aircraft. And it's in one of our facilities today, but that's by far the exception. Um, I think the, uh, the majority of our industry uh, I would say 99% understand uh, how to keep the aircraft airworthy. Uh, we've seen some of our avionics teams, they've been asked to maybe work some intermittent squawks, some of the challenging things that have you know, been on the aircraft because the aircraft is down. Uh, but I would say overall, um, I think our, our industry is, is poised to start flying safely tomorrow because you know, they, they did not want to have that aircraft uh, the flight department didn't want to be asked by the owner to fly tomorrow and not have it available. So uh, I think uh, that would not be the message they'd want to give the owner. So I think they've done a great job of doing that. Uh, and like I said, of all the aircraft and all the sites we've had, uh, we see very, very few that are just parked and, and, uh, and, and not adequately maintained. We, we Ron, how, how are you supporting your customers uh, as, as they return their aircraft to the air? Sure, sure. Thanks, Bruce, for the question. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I agree with Aaron for the, for the larger aircraft, for the companies with flight departments, they're professionals, they're maintained well, really no risk there. Uh, you know, of course, when you get down the small airplanes, the single pilot airplanes, whether they be a, a jet or turboprops or pistons, sometimes they don't have a maintenance department. Uh, the owner is the, is the, uh, the chief pilot and the chief maintainer. And so, for those customers, uh, we've been doing a lot of webinars and information sharing. We've got our product support teams with our, you know, our hotlines with our, our engineers and our technical experts fielding calls about, hey, if you haven't flown for 60 days, you know, we recommend you take a look at this, you take a look at this, check this out. If you need help, we're here for you. So we're proactively kind of pushing information out to those customers who are, who, uh, you know, are, are ready to return to flight to make sure they're ready to go. And of course, uh, you know, we're here to, to take care of them if, if they need it. And then we're building a lot of calls also from the same customers about uh, about cleaning their airplanes and, and the COVID-19. And we're making sure they get the right technical information, that they don't damage their aircraft, or as you discussed earlier in the example with the alcohol, you know, induce some other problem in the airplane, but by, by, with good intentions ended up in a bad result. So we're, we're trying to train up those customers on those types of things and, and return to flight. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, Joel or Tony, you wanna add anything to that topic? All right, um, just uh, sort of staying in the maintenance world, uh, just if I could uh, ask a follow on. Just at, uh, Ron, you mentioned, you know, in, in, uh, as a pilot, it's a great time to actually uh, get up uh, and, and, and get some experience that you wouldn't normally get because um, you get you, you can have a lot of support uh, infrastructure with nobody else up there and a lot of the other risks uh, are down. Similarly, in the maintenance world, if I've got an aircraft 
uh, and I'm not flying it, now's a great time as I maybe put in, uh, I look at a, a filter system. I know you've worked on, you've put guidance in place. Both of you have, have uh, uh, provided information to help customers. How do I keep my airplane clean? How do I filter the air? Uh, what sort of things can I do? Are you seeing people uh, invest their money in their aircraft in, in upgrading either for public health or safety? seatbelt upgrades or anything else at an unusual rate? Uh, well, I, I could take it first. We, we haven't seen a big uh, upturn in people uh, upgrading for health reasons. They're asking lots of questions about cleaning. They're asking lots of questions about the, the current air cycle machines on board a, a Citation, what, what kind of cleaning filter system it has. There are some uh, companies out there advertising some special filtering and things, but we haven't seen a huge number of, of takes on that. It'll be inter interesting to see where, where the industry goes. It's more around cleaning, distancing, masks, and uh, what's, the, what's the current circulation system? What's it clean and how efficient is it? Aaron, do you see anything uh, in your customer base? Yeah, I think on the large, ultra-large aircraft, they, there are a lot of questions relating to the, uh, I think there's a system called ACA, an ionization system. I think um, I think we have anywhere from uh, 20 or so that we've installed to date. We have another, or at least that have signed agreements. And I think we're ordering 40 more systems. Uh, in most cases, some of those larger aircraft, they need two of the, the units in. Uh, so it's not a huge amount at the same time. Uh, tells you there's around 30, 40 customers um, that uh, are opting to put the system in. Um, so I think it's, it's um, the biggest thing it would be we're, we're trying to make sure that when the aircraft come in, that they're clean. So we actually, we have a fogging system that we use with a, with a specific spray that the EPA has approved. Uh, we cover the cockpit uh, with a plastic and then we spray everything. And... Um, and that's just to make sure our teams don't, the aircraft don't, doesn't come in with the virus. And then before they leave, we do the same thing to the aircraft to make sure that we can deliver to the customer a virus via your aircraft. Because, you know, we may have an aircraft where 30, 40, 50 people or more have, have been touching it. And uh, again, we're very similar to Tony. I think we've had five cases out of 2,400. So we don't have a significant amount, but we wanna make sure the owners Understand that they're going to receive an aircraft that has a virus free when, uh, when they when it comes back from the facility. All right, great. Um, so, uh, I think the, the the attention to that clean aircraft is a great uh, transition to uh, sort of another question. And uh, Tony, you are already talked about the impact to your workforce, um, but just you know, as we really do across uh, all of our industry, we're committed to the safety of our employees. Uh, uh, you know, we, we've got the challenges of the CDC guidelines and how we implement them in, in our normal procedures and, and how we conduct our business. Um, so I'm, I'm curious if you could talk about how your organizations are evolving your processes as a result of, of, of COVID-19. And are you seeing anything in those changes that you think might become permanent? Um, I'll start with you, and I noted in your opening uh, uh, description of the change, you did shut down the production line uh, uh, for a period of time as you looked at, you know, how could you uh, continue the production in, in light of uh, the CDC guidelines and, and that. Can you talk a little bit more about that and what other changes you've made? Sure, sure, absolutely. So, um, you know, it's, a, it's a affected every aspect of our business, and we really started with a, a COVID task force or team. Uh, you know, folks that uh, we grab from different disciplines and put them together on a team to help us figure this out. And, and we had to look everything from production to, to maintenance to even how do you deliver an airplane? It's, it, the customers coming here from Brazil, you know, travel restrictions and, and receptivity. And so we've changed a lot of those processes from top to bottom and starting in the factory. We had to look at everything from how, do, how can we space out? Can we get work separated if possible, if the tooling allows? Can we, sh can we stagger shift times? Can we stagger break times and break rooms? And I'm sure everybody's companies are doing similar things. We had to think that from top to bottom, you know, but it might come down to you can't spread out if you're installing an interior in a, 
in a tube of an airplane, you might have three or four people in there. And so now you're looking at PPE and cleaning. And, and so all that stuff has been looked at from top to bottom and, and all that's going to remain in place. And we're constantly altering it as we learn more about how the world's changing, how the disease is transmitted uh, and adjusting it every day. Every day when you come to work, you have to go through a screening process uh, here visitors or employees to verify you haven't come in contact with somebody, you don't feel sick, you know, uh, and, and that gives everybody a little more comfort in, in that we're trying to do everything possible to protect the safety of our employees and our customers. And so th those processes will remain in place, for, you know, for the foreseeable future uh, until we get past this or, and then some of them may just become the new process. If we decide that's a better process, and that's a healthier way of doing it, we may just adopt them. I know for, for us, we, we are dealing with similar challenge, challenges across our inspector workforce um, and, and really adapted through, you know, initially a lot of, uh, let's say it was a certificate management meeting, which we would have done face to face. You know, we now do it like we're doing this. Um, and uh, you have probably seen a, a change in how often you'd see an inspector come by either a, a manufacturing facility or or a repair station facility. And so we're dealing with the same kinds of uh, issues as we figure out, you know, how, what's our personal uh, protective equipment as we get out there. We've, we've found uh, the use of video and communication technology uh, to, to really be more powerful, I think, than we originally imagined um, in terms of what you can accomplish uh, even at a distance, uh, at least if the purpose is inspection. Uh, obviously, I think it's different if you're, if you're bending metal. Um, so yeah. 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 The office part was maybe the easier part for us to solve than the service, the manufacturing, the customer interaction. And all, all companies are dealing with it. So, yeah. Aaron, what do, what do you see uh, at, at Duncan? Uh, very similar to what Ron mentioned. I think uh, the only thing I would, a couple of things I would add is, um, you know, we high risk individuals, if they could work from home, we, we had them work from home. So we probably have had, and in, or in some cases, we, we used to have our sales team work in pods uh, where it was an airframe and install uh, an interior person, uh, paint person, all that was selling that product line all set together. And uh, we just felt like we couldn't, without adding dou doubling or tripling the office space, we couldn't create that social distance. So we, we have them working from home. Um, so, and also there were, there were a number of our employees where all of a sudden they had students at home or young elementary student, you know, students that, that they needed to share responsibilities with their spouse. And so we have a lot more people working on alternate shifts now. Um, I kind of joke every day seems like a Saturday because there's, it's everything so much more spread out than it was before. Um, and, you know, we were real concerned early on um, when we, we were trying to do restrictions on customers coming in. But what we quickly found is uh, they didn't want to come in. They wanted to drop the aircraft off and get in a rental car, or in some cases, we even flew them back home uh, because they, 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 you know, they wanted to again stay safe. So it's, it's uh, the industry I think has worked well together in terms of our customers and our companies to all have the same thing, keep our team members safe. Um, and I think uh, they appreciate that we have those standards in place uh, because that way we, we're not putting the risk of not being able to finish the aircraft because we have, you know, uh, the virus within our facility. So. Um, you know, I, you know, it was uh, quite the evolution as people changed with the mask and do we need masks and not need masks. Um, we also had a lot of requests. We started, we made our own masks for our team members and their family members. And then we started getting requests in the community. So we, um, in some cases, some of the prisons sold their own masks, but we, we did the cutting. So I think we've cut 50,000 masks in the last uh, uh, 10 weeks. And um, we, it's really, um, we have a group of sewers from a couple of large churches that are doing it, but a lot of the, the county jail, the state uh, prison sewed their own. In fact, it was kind of ironic. They, they were, the, the county jail was sewn for the police department because we also outfitted all the police fire rescue in our communities with these masks. So it's been quite a community effort. Um, we continue to do it for hospitals and we, we were, uh, we've been doing gowns again that we have the sewers lined up to do that so it's been a, a, a great community um, effort that we've seen come around um, uh, to make sure our community stays safe and those in our community that 
had to work through this, um, you know, all throughout the time, the police, fire, rescue, that they were safe as well. So I think our industry has done a great job of doing that, um, not just in our community, but throughout, throughout, you know, throughout our industry. That's a, that's a powerful uh, parallel, um, sort of the overall theme of, of this panel is that, that's, that the safe flight is dependent upon a broad community on the ground that supports the flight. And so that's a, it's a powerful parallel, I think, uh, Aaron, in terms of the public health is also dependent on a similar team uh, that makes that happen. Tony, do you wanna add anything? You, were, you, you addressed some of these effects uh, in terms of what Signature seen earlier. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, overall, I, so I'll answer a little bit of the, the, the last part of the question, which is what do I think is gonna become permanent? Um, some of the things, you know, I know some of our customers would hope that they get to keep driving their vehicles on the ramp and going straight up to their airplane. Um, we would like for that to stay permanent too. Um, I'm not sure it's going to be in every airport, but uh, it is a luxury that uh, the customer enjoys and it keeps them out of the facilities. Um, some of the food service things that we're doing differently, how we deliver, you know, products. I don't think people will see popcorn anytime soon in our facilities. Some may be really happy about that. Others may be really mad and I'm going to get a lot of hate mail, um, but we'll give you some microwave popcorn and you can go the other way. Uh, one of the other things we're doing is health tests, though. I, I don't know if that's going to continue. Obviously, once we get into a vaccine program, um, I think that's going to be sort of this temporary stop. But one of the things we will do is continue to offer cleaning services. And I think we'll continue to do an enhanced cleaning, which we do and have added to our protocol. I don't see that going away in the future. Uh, I think we'll be a lot more cognizant as an operator and continuing to provide a healthy environment for not only our employees, but you know, giving our customers that confidence. So I think there's gonna be some permanent changes around how uh, we interact with the customer. Hopefully we'll be able to take masks off soon because it's, you know, you miss that human connection. And, uh, um, but in the meantime, we'll continue to do those uh, things to keep everybody safe and hopefully get over this soon. All right, well, uh, thank you all for that discussion. Um, that, that, those are all the questions uh, that I was going to ask. Uh, and so I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Brianna to come back and uh, see if we have any questions from the audience. Thanks, Bruce. Um, we do have a few questions. Uh, this one is for Textron. What are the recommendations and guidance for customers on the cleaning and sanitizing of aircraft? We've got uh, uh, instructions for that with our technical teams and our service support teams about the types of uh, cleaning supplies you should use and how you should go about doing that. I'm not prepared to lay those all out on the, the the video conference today, but uh, you can call our one call or any of our service facilities. We've got pretty thorough instructions or we're prepared to help you do it. Uh, so any of those customers just give us a call and we'll walk them through that. We, we publish some of that as well. Great, thank you. Bruce, this next question is for you from Michael. What are the possibilities to transition to the paperless way of doing business, both with the FAA and within the industry? Um, well, I'm, I'm using some handwritten cards uh, the, today, so uh, I may not be the best uh, illustration. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've already taken some uh, pretty big strides uh, forced by circumstance um, to transition to a lot more electronic-based uh, interaction um, in terms of what the FAA does and how we're conducting our business uh, in, in uh, safety certification and, and oversight. Um, so we have been transitioning, at least across our organization, uh, to a paperless environment. And uh, most of our workforce uh, since uh, mid-March has been working uh, predominantly from their homes to promote their safety. Uh, and we've been able uh, to work in electronic signatures across the board, coordination uh, and, and issuance of uh, policy, um, uh, certifications, amendments, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, you know, the, the example of the SFAR came up earlier. Um, you know, that, that we, we, we as an, a large organization uh, developed, uh, coordinated and implemented uh, that, that special regulation for, for COVID-19 uh, relief in certain circumstances without moving a piece of paper. So, so we did that in an electronic world. So I, I think we've taken great strides. 
Um, and certainly we're looking at that and identifying what aspects of that uh, can we keep that help us do our business uh, more efficiently uh, going forward. Uh, safety is gonna always be paramount. So we're gonna wanna make sure that we're not compromising our ability to, to, to actually uh, uh, audit or oversee or evaluate something that needs to be uh, uh, overseen from a safety perspective. So we are looking forward to, uh, as states reopen, you know, having, having some inspectors back out uh, on site. Um, but we've, like I've mentioned, we've been able to do some pretty great things with, with technology. Um, so I, that would be my answer. I don't know if any of the other fellow panelists want to add anything from their perspective. I'd go out with a compliment to your uh, colleagues on the airport's office, uh, the CARES Act, uh, and say thank you uh, for FAA, to FAA and the Congress for stepping up. Uh, we had a considerable amount of money, $10 billion for the airport community. I would note that uh, the piece for targeted to general aviation airports was smaller than we would have liked, and we are uh, continuing to advocate uh, in Washington for additional help to general aviation airports and to the aviation ecosystem that supports those airports. Uh, one of the questions on the previous panel was where are we seeing the economic impact? And I would argue it's far and wide beyond just the airport. Uh, and everybody's been impacted by this. And I think we could use more help from Congress and we're arguing for that. Uh, my point back to the question was, as part of the process for getting an inordinate amount of money and grants out the door, the airport's office has relied more heavily on electronic submissions and exchange of information. And I hear from our members uh, repeatedly about how that has eased the process, made it more uh, seamless. Uh, and, and so my compliments to FAA for moving forward in the airport's office as it relates to grants. And I know uh, we have a lot of airports would like to see that continue moving forward. Thanks, Joel. Um, Brianna, if I could just squeeze one point in before the next Absolutely. Um, uh, so I apologize uh, to the panelists and the audience. Uh, we're safety professionals. Uh, we did, we, you may have noticed uh, Aaron is uh, no longer on the screen. Uh, uh, the unfortunate news is they had a lightning strike uh, uh, near him. The good news is he's safe. Uh, the bad news is uh, he's completely offline. Um, so I uh, just wanted to update everybody on his whereabouts. Uh, Brianna, do we have any other questions? We do. And now that we're down a panelist, you guys are going to have to pull his weight. So this next question is for everyone. And it's a repeat, actually, from the first panel. And that question is, as a pilot, what is the most important thing I should consider when I go flying this weekend? Well, uh, I would say you need to go fly a Cessna or Beechcraft. That's what the most important thing is this weekend. <laughs> um, Look, the, the second most panel, important. <laughs> the earlier panel talked about the need for the pilot to be ready. Are you, you know, currency doesn't equal proficiency. And so are you ready? Are you trained and ready for the mission? Are you prepared for it? Uh, if not, you know, pick somebody with you. We talked a little earlier about is your airplane ready? If you're ready and the airplane's ready, go fly. The sky awaits. Great time to go training. I'm, I'm optimistic on general aviation that we can help lead a recovery, uh, a return to work recovery in the country by facilitating travel. So, um, and we're gonna do that by getting out there and, and flying and, and doing business and doing work and doing leisure travel. That supports a lot of industries. So um, I would say um, go fly. I'd hop in and just reemphasize what we talked about on the front end, Bruce, and that is the rapidly changing situation uh, at airports with regard to ATC facilities and the hours for those facilities with regard to some of the services um, at some uh, particularly smaller airports. Uh, and just the, the, the fact that we have a lot of aircraft parked on movement areas at a number of commercial service airports, we talked about that. Uh, and just the evolving health situation with local requirements. Um, we've even had as early as this morning, uh, the state of Arizona and the state of Oregon make some changes with required with mat as particularly as it relates to masks. Uh, you've had individual uh, jurisdiction cities that will make those changes. So again, just being educated on where it is going and what the situation on the ground is there and in the air getting there, I think is critical for any pilot. 
I think it's a, it is a, a wonderful opportunity to get some experience as Ron has articulated and Joel, in what you're describing, I, I talked about that in, in my opening remarks in terms of, yeah, get the experience, but you know what? It's a good time to check your experience because the experience you had from before may not be relevant uh, today because of the unique situation. So I think that's good. Only other thing I would like to add, um, the first panelists talked about some of their pilot efficiency programs. And I just want to put a plug in for the FAA WINGS program uh, and encourage folks to go to faasafety.gov uh, and, and take one of the WINGS courses. Which is a great segue because our next question from Guy is actually about the FAA WINGS program. The FAA WINGS program is a great way to keep safety at the forefront of GA pilots' mind. Do you see an increase in the use of programs like WINGS to help promote safety in periods like this? I actually don't have any information on, on the degree of activity. Um, so I, 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 I can't uh, provide any insight on that. I don't know if any of, of you across your programs and your education programs, uh, whether you have insight on that. Well, that's definitely something we can get right. back so to you after I, the fact. I, oh, yeah, and another, th I would say for all the folks watching, uh, move that needle for us now. So thanks, Brianna. No problem. This question is from Anne. What will the long-term effects of the decrease in fuel sales have on our airport infrastructure? That, that's a great question. I think it speaks to the evolving nature of how we've, you know, financed the system, how we've operated the system. I think uh, what has become clear over the last hundred days is some of the expectations and assumptions that we had on how it is we operate the system how it is that we finance the system, how it is that we invest and build the system moving forward are probably gonna require a constant evaluation. Uh, some of the issues around that are tricky and difficult to get your arms around, but I think uh, out of uh, unprecedented situations like we have today is an opportunity to have more conversations about how it is that we finance the system and airport improvements and air traffic control improvements moving forward. Uh, it's a changed world. And uh, I think there are uh, challenges before us, but also opportunities, I think, to, uh, to again, have some grown up conversations about how it is we move forward, factoring in fuel sales, uh, factoring in some of the other uh, financing mechanisms. Those are always tough, but uh, I think uh, an opportunity to have some of those discussions. Yeah, I'll just add, you know, we've had some great conversations with our airport partners. You know, we provide a lot of fuel farms across the network, certainly our own. And in many cases, we are the fuel farm at the airport. Um, we intend to obviously continue to invest in those. But, to, you know, the airport is also appreciative of that as a revenue source and revenue stream for them. So they've been working with us quite closely on figuring out how we mitigate those, but continue to make sure that we're making safety improvements um, fortunately, at this point, you know, some of the things we can defer is the expansion of these fuel farms. Oftentimes, you know, we're required to be, uh, maintain days in inventory. Well, with volume down, so we can shift those dollars that we're going to use to expand fuel farms and put it into other things, uh, protection systems and, uh, and reallocate those dollars. So uh, I can tell you all of the airports that we've been um, working with have been absolutely fantastic in sort of figuring out how we continue to make sure the infrastructure is robust and available um, and doing it through ways that we can continue the capital inputs and, you know, and continue to spend money to support that infrastructure that is so critical. And um, I don't foresee any issues at this point. And, you know, certainly as we're seeing volume coming back, um, it's still, um, it's, it's sufficient to be able to keep the infrastructure. And I don't foresee any sort of significant impact infrastructure in the future on the fuel side. Great. Um, this next question is for Signature. Have you seen an uptick in new avionics, ADSB installation, or preventative maintenance? Uh, so the first part, yes. Um, we've seen um, people bringing in their airplanes earlier um, relative to some events, and so effectively burning some green time um, on their planes and taking advantage of you know the the 
reduced demand for flying. And as a result of that, they brought the aircraft in. And so we can continue to do that. We're also seeing airplanes that are being parked and say they have a fleet of 20 aircraft they're flying to, um, and they're putting those aircraft into long-term storage. And so, you know, we're seeing uh, some different uh, maintenance activities. We don't usually, or weren't doing a lot of long-term storage. We are now in the long-term storage of airplanes and what those require and uh, have been, you know, doing that where we can to support our, our flying partners. Uh, I'm sure Ron has some significant input on this as well, because he does a lot more uh, ADSB upgrades than I do. Well, regarding the ADSB, you know, most people got that taken care of last year. I know there was a small percentage that didn't, and uh, they may choose never to, although there are a few ADSB upgrades still occurring. Yeah. During this downturn, I would say, you know, the last 60 days, because we were going full out and then we just stopped. With the economic uncertainty, we haven't seen a lot of requests for major mods. I think people are coming in, hey, I'm going to be down. Can you take care of these few things? A couple squawks, an annual, whatever. That We see a lot of that. But we don't see, I want a, a G5000 upgrade right now because they're uncertain kind of where the economy's going. And I don't see a lot of major mods and it's too bad Aaron drop, dropped off. He might add more to that. Um, but that's kind of what we're seeing is a lot of routine uh, maintenance and small stuff. And people are deferring the big stuff until they kind of see where the, the economy's going. Great. Great. That's all I have. Um, Thank you everyone for participating. We're gonna see if the administrator is still with us to um, offer some closing comments. I am here. And uh, thanks Brianna and uh, thanks uh, to uh, uh, everyone for your participation and, uh, and, and really some great uh, discussion, great candid discussion, uh, a lot of interesting and very important uh, topics covered over the last couple of hours um, about your uh, your operational and business experiences associated with um, you know the the COVID nineteen uh, era that we're in, and uh, you know we'll definitely continue this dialogue. I think we need to uh, invite Aaron back uh, to our next event. Uh, you know we look forward to uh, to hearing his continued perspective. And I think it's really important that we'll continue to have the, this kind of dialogue and uh, collaboration as we continue to navigate through, uh, through this uncharted territory. Um, I'll just say what I said at the, at the beginning, um, that GA is the lifeblood of our incredibly flexible and responsive uh, aerospace transportation system. Um, it's got unique challenges um, punctuated by shifting demand, as, as all of you had pointed out and the extreme variety and diversity of operations. And, and we at the FA are committed uh, to working with the industry to ensure its health and vitality in this time of fast change and new risks. And you know we're very fortunate in the United States to have the safest, most diverse, uh, the most dynamic and the most innovative aerospace system in the world. And our work and collaboration in meetings like this is absolutely foundational and critical to us making real and lasting progress in uh, making this important sector as beneficial to the American public and the economy as it can possibly be. And we at the agency stand ready to help you in any way that we can so that we can remain true uh, to our safety mandate. Um, on the two panels, first of all, uh, thanks to uh, Dan and Bruce for doing a, an outstanding job moderating our two panels. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and thanks to Mark, Jack, David, and Jalen on the first panel. Um, you know, I, th I thought the first panel, the a lot of parallel and uh, very similar topics to what we talked about um, with respect to uh, the airline industry on our town hall with the airlines last month. Uh, you know, uncertainty and unpredictability is, is, something that's a challenge in a safe, stable system. You know, although we are very diverse, uh, you know, we want to be predictable and we want to be, uh, we want to keep, 
you know, a stable system that where everybody knows what's going on and everybody's qualified and, and ready to fly and our airplanes are, are maintained. And uncertainty is not a good thing psychologically. And, uh, you know, uh, Mark talked about rusty pilots, you know, getting out there to fly and the amount of activity that AOPA has on its website going right now. And, and uh, certainly some of the mitigations that we have put in place with having to extend deadlines and, and currencies uh, has been important to that. Um, I did think it was interesting on the first panel, uh, the interest uh, has remained high and um, in, in general aviation uh, and that there seems to be a longer term view about growth, which I think is something that we really need to, to take uh, into account. Although we're going through a disruption and some uncertainty right now, I think the future uh, is very bright and there's going to be a lot of opportunity for, uh, for young people and for a new generation of aerospace professionals to come into the industry. On the second panel, again, Ron, Tony, uh, Aaron, and Joel, uh, just really appreciate uh, the dialogue. Um, you know, talked a lot about the, uh, uh, the opportunities as well. Uh, workforce issues, again, some short-term issues, but the future is bright and there's a lot of opportunity. I'll, I'll actually be doing a, uh, a session with Embry-Riddle tomorrow night talking about uh, that exact point, that even though there's a bit of uncertainty right now, there's still a lot of opportunity in our industry. And, uh, and then Joel's comment about, you know, uh, know before you go, you know, that, that there's a little bit of unpredictability about what's, what you're going to face when you arrive at, the, at, at your destination these days with uh, quarantines and and uh, the public health situation. So the more you can do to make sure that you're prepared is, is always a good thing in aviation, but even more critical now. So, you know, again, just to close, um, you know, I told the airline sector during the town, their town hall, there's a lot of work to do, um, but we can all take great pride in how high we have the bar uh, for aviation safety. With this group of leaders uh, and all of our stakeholders in the industry, you know, the bar is only gonna get higher. Yeah, even as we navigate these unprecedented challenges. And if we work together, we can overcome any obstacle. We also need to remember that, that there's no absolute when it comes to safety. Um, it's really a journey. It's not a, you, know, you never get to your destination. You're continually trying to improve. And our government industry collaboration has been foundational to achieving the level of safety that we enjoy today. And that's gotta continue despite of the challenges that we currently face. So again, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, stay safe, uh, stay healthy. The best to you and, and all of your, uh, your members and your stakeholders. And thanks again for participating. We look forward to, uh, to being together again soon. Thank you.